pretty pricey. Um, but these days with open OCD and some of the open source projects, you get the needed hardware for less than 100 bucks. Now with JTAG access, you can remotely debug with GDB, debug the kernel, the bootloader, and so on. Now JTAG has been talked about to death, and I won't dwell on it. There's a lot of resources online. There's a lot more information. So here's just the hardware debugger connected to the motherboard. Now it's probably obvious, but the use of hardware debuggers and things of that nature have absolutely nothing to do with the ATM attacks that I'll be demonstrating. It is simply used uh, to initially gain access so we can then go on to find real vulnerabilities. But um, speaking of JTAG, I actually learned a valuable lesson when I was messing with one of the ATMs. I had the JTAG hooked up and I was screwing around and I accidentally wiped out a massive chunk of the firmware and overwrote all the um, ATM files on it. Now at the time I couldn't get a hold of the software to reflash it because I wasn't an ATM distributor. So I actually had to call a licensed uh, ATM technician to come around to my house. <laughs> now, three guys arrive, and of course they ask again, you know, why are these ATMs in your house? And I said, oh, I haven't moved them into my store yet, and all this type of thing. Um, but anyway, see, so what happened? How, how did you remove all this? I was, oh, I had it on a card. I was trying to change a splash screen, and it all just wiped out. He's like, yeah, no, they'll do that. They'll do that. <laughs> and he. Uh, you know, and he, so he starts going to work on the ATM, and I'm like, firmware, what is that, mate? You know, acting completely stupid. Um, he ends up teaching me a hell of a lot about hacking ATMs. I got his business card, we kept in touch. Unfortunately, <laughs> after this presentation, that relationship may be severed. <laughs> oh, yeah, so the lesson is always back up the firmware first. So now that we can debug, we need a way to inject. Um, with the debugger connected, simply set a breakpoint on create process. Um, and that, the opposite was found by simply dump, dumping the memory from the ATM and just doing a byte compared to an offline version of core DLL. Now when working with the ARM processor, uh, the parameters when they're passed to the function are passed in registers before they utilize the stack. So R0 will have the first parameter, which is the executable, for what you want to execute. You simply replace that string with, with what well, would normally be the ATM executable uh, and override it with explorer.exe. Now if explorer doesn't exist on the image, um, then you can just put a copy of explorer on a removable drive and pass that full path to, to create process. And so then you get a shell on the ATM. Um, when I first was playing around with the ATMs, I was quite excited just to have a little shell on them, so I had them playing movies and whatnot. But <laughs> not really surprising, the ATMs are pretty crap for playing movies. Slow frame rate and the six inch screen, so it will not be replacing the flat screen. <laughs> so now with Explorer, we can uh, plug in a USB drive and a keyboard and copy off the files for reverse engineering. Then we can modify the registry so Explorer will always boot. Now, remote debugging with JTAG over GDB is not the ideal way to debug a Windows machine. So the next step is to set up a better debugging environment. And there's a way to debug Windows CE applications without having Active Sync installed. And that's to debug with Visual Studio over Ethernet. So you simply build an empty project, overwrite the local executable with the executable from the device that you want to debug, set, it to, set the correct TCP settings, copy the file over, run it under the debugger, and you have application debugging with Visual Studio. So now finally we have everything in place to be able to reverse engineer the software to locate vulnerabilities, but to also test any software that we create for the ATM. So planning an attack, uh, there's a fairly limited attack surface really. We have the card reader, but assuming we have an overflow or some other string based attack via the card tracks, uh, there's a limited amount of characters and a very restricted character set. So I'm not gonna say it's not possible, but I will say it would be unlikely to be practical or reliable. Uh, the keypad, another long shot, but maybe there's possible master passwords or backdoors left in by the developers. Then the network, so any open ports, an answering phone line, any options for a remote attack. And we also have the various inputs on the motherboard itself, but of course this requires access to the motherboard. Um, so of course progress is never really made without a few failures along the way. And in my attempt to come up with a Terminator 2 esque hack, I made this little device. It's basically an electromagnet wired up to an amp, which is connected to a media player. And you create a web file which is created to simulate the data on a magnetic stripe. Um, the electromagnet, plug into the ATM, flick the switch, play the web file, and uh, the ATM will think of magnetic stripes being read. Technically, it works fine, but it was actually bugger all help. 
So the goal, of course, is to execute code on the ATM. So I'll talk about these walk-up attacks first. Now, the cash dispenser is housed at the very least by a safe. If you take the cheapest option, if you spend a bit more, you can get even more heavy-duty protection. The motherboard, on the other hand, is protected by a one-key-fits-all lock. <laughs> and this is, this is actually standard practice across the board. And these keys, like almost everything else on the internet, are ev easily available to add to cart. And uh, funnily enough, there used to be Diebold keys last year when I was looking, um, but they've since vanished. But I'm sure of a little creativity they could be found. But as you can see, most manufacturers uh, take this approach. So the walk-up attack. So now with your master key, you have access to the USB slots and what other inputs. So you can pop open the motherboard compartment, insert a USB key in a couple of seconds, a lot faster than installing a skimmer, right? Now, even though the attack time here is short, there's still the possibility of being detected. But, you know, I suppose that's a great thing about these retail and standalone type ATMs. You know, they're out by the restrooms, they're out of sight, off by the Siggy machine or something. And I suppose then there's that also so like psycholo uh, psychological aspect of using an ATM machine. It's kind of considered rude to look over someone's shoulder. And uh, unless, of course, you're a criminal, and then he would probably learn a trick or two anyway. Now, all ATMs need a way to upgrade their firmware. And this is mo most often leveraged via the removable drives. So the ATM application checks the drive for a valid upgrade, if a valid firmware is found, upgrade, and store whatever we decide to add in there. Now, of course, the firmware is typically a proprietary format. Um, there are checksums, encryption, and the algorithms are easily figured out by reversing the code on the ATM side. So once you can create your own firmware package that adheres to the correct format, well, then you can upgrade but upgrade with a few modifications, of course. Now, the most important attack is the remote attack. Now, most if not all ATMs that run on a Windows-based OS support some form of remote monitoring or remote configuration. So this allows you to log into your ATM remotely, review or change the settings, get stats, change the splash screens, and so on. Another quite useful feature is the ability to up remotely upgrade the software. Now, this is sometimes a feature, but always something you can leverage if you have a vulnerability. Now, obviously, authentication is required to be able to do anything useful. Uh, with the particular model I'll be demonstrating, both a serial number and a remote password are required, and they're both made up of a combination of numbers and letters, and a five-second delay is forced after each connection attempt. So a brute force is basically out of the question. So we require a vulnerability within the authentication process, and it just so happens. So let me introduce Dillinger. Dillinger is my remote ATM attack or administration tool, whatever way you want to look at it. Dillinger named after the bank robber, of course. Um, so we've, ta we've talked about loading code on a local ATM machine with a master key and a flash drive and the correctly formed firmware, you're basically set. But the obvious drawback here is you have to interact with the machine itself. So the ultimate win would be able to execute code or load code remotely, and that's where Dillinger comes in. Um, so Dillinger takes advantage of a fairly severe vulnerability in the ATM management capability. And interestingly, although most operators don't use the remote monitoring, it's enabled by default on this particular manufacturer. So, shutting. Now, typically to log into the machine remotely, we require yeah, the knowledge of the serial number and the password, but due to an awesome vulnerability, I can bypass all authentication on the device. And the remote attack is 100% reliable. So Dillinger supports TCP IP and it supports dial-up as well. And I heard through a fairly knowledgeable source that most of these stand-ups, uh, standalones, about approximately 95% of them are still on a dial-up connection. Now, of course, back in the day, finding an ATM over the phone line would be a long process of nights and nights of war dialing. But you know, thanks to tools like HD Moore's Warbox, you can map out modems on exchange in a matter of hours then write a custom tool to find the ATM responses and you're away. So Dillinger features. So Dillinger will allow you to manage an unlimited amount of ATMs through its interface. Uh, you can add a group, so you add a city. Under the city, you add each individual ATM, either its IP address or its phone number. Now the heart of the tool, of course, is the authentication bypass that it exploits. And this is the stepping stone to be able to do anything useful. So one feature in Dillinger is to be able to test the bypass in a way which confirms the vulnerability but doesn't actually modify the remote ATM in any way or leave any trace. 
So the obvious problem with finding a remote ATM is that you have 